Hello, everybody. Um, I, from the agenda, I've seen that I'm the last one between our great um, party yeah, and um, this, uh, this uh, talk here. So um, it will be about um, the Internet of Things a little bit, how you can build your own IoT sensor, and uh, also, of course, how to integrate it into Zavix. So um, better does warm, IoT meets Zavix. First question when we were addressing this, this topic was to get an understanding about really what is the IoT. And in a nutshell, we can say that the Internet of Things is more or less a network to provide our physical world, the world we are interacting with, uh, with the world of computer and data processing. And, and usually this requires some, some sorts of devices, which we call sensors, so they take some metrics, or we have uh, actuators, which actually perform some actions. And um, on top of this, of course, we need some connectivity to backend services or other devices. And typical IT application types are in the area of, um, let's say, industrial applications, manufacturing, for example, um, infrastructure applications, energy management, but also in the consumer market, smart home, very big market, and uh, commercial applications like uh, healthcare. And when we look into these areas, we're talking about really, really big, big numbers. And uh, this is, a, this is a from, uh, from Gartner from 2015, and they made an estimate that we will reach in 2020, so we are now in 2018, they will reach like 20 billion devices. And this is not talking about like cars or so, or like mobile phones, and we're really talking about connected devices beyond that, so a really huge number. And look to um, the development from 2014 over to 2016, it's big, it's really big. Now, when talking about these sort of devices, we have now a basic understanding about um, the IoT, from the idea of the IoT, what makes up an IoT device, was the next question we were asking ourselves. And um, basically, an IoT device has to be self-contained. So something that only works if I plug it into my notebook or my desktop would certainly be not an IoT device. So it needs to be, uh, be self-contained. As said before, it should either work as an, as an sensor or as an actuator. And it needs to provide connectivity um, either to our IT network or to maybe a gateway service. Take your smartwatch and take your smartphone. In this case, you have a, uh, uh, you have a communication to your, to, to your smartphone and the smartphone itself then connects to cloud service. And in this case, it would usually exchange um, data, maybe small data, temperature for example, can be uh, bigger data as well. And if everything goes fine, then it will be able to be remotely monitored, controlled, or even updated. Then we have the scenario uh, which is, uh, it can be stationary or it can be mobile, and if it's running on mobile, then of course we need to make sure that we have good, but, uh, a good uh, battery lifetime. And uh, this is something which really needs a little bit more um, consideration. So the uh, type of network communication on one hand and power consumption data rates and ranges of those devices. And here you see a very basic technology comparison where we see our mobile networks like the, 3G, uh, the 2G network, the 3G network, and the 4G network, 5G is uh, on its way, in comparison also to um, the well-known Wi-Fi networks, and some very specific IoT protocols like, for example, LoRa Zigfox. And without going into the details of this table, the slides will be made to you available from the conference team, I guess, after, after the events. But without going into the depths, you see that, for example, specialized protocols like LoRa will grant you um, a long battery lifetime. If you look to operating a battery, last row, or one of the last rows, you see plus 10 years. And uh, on the other hand, they will provide very, very, a very, very small um, usable data weight, like, for example, 250 bits per second. So no, not kilobits, but bits per second. But it's fine. I mean, it's, um, we're talking about IoT, we're talking about small, small data, so that wouldn't fit. For our device, we made the choice and said, well, we take Wi-Fi. Why? Because it's available in most environments. 2.4 gigahertz performs a little bit better than 5 gigahertz performs. Um, it's cheap to implement. And it's perfect if battery power doesn't matter. 
and uh, we have direct access to uh, IP-based networks, which we won't have if we use protocols like Glow or Sigfox, and we won't have access to IP networks. We need a gateway service in between, and um, because we have access to IP-based networks, we can easily implement the uh, Zabbix support, which is the goal of um, all of this here, and of course, we need to make sure that we have um, taken care or whether we take care about um, uh, the power thing, so we only have to enable the radio uh, transmitters and the, and the Wi-Fi stack if it's needed. And um, that has led to the design that you can see on the uh, slide here. So our IoT sensor will actively connect to a Zabbix proxy or a Zabbix server. So we, have, we can make a choice. We can say, well, it should connect now, so we can keep the the uh, uh, power consumption as low as possible. Um, also, when we use a Zabbix proxy, we have access to uh, the uh, TLS connection, so we can encrypt our data. TLS usually takes one or two seconds on top of, the, of uh, the communication protocol, and that is what we don't want to, because Wi-Fi is expensive on battery. On the other hand, we can, of course, connect directly to a Zabbix server. So there's no polling. The IT sensor will do the connection and uh, we'll send the data through to Zabbix. And um, that's the result, that is how it looks like. You can see here uh, a box uh, containing the uh, microcontroller, um, the sensor stuff, and you see a connector for an external sensor. But before going into the depths of um, and the details of the technical description, just a um, brief description of a use case, and uh, thanks to FHB, Original GmbH, and Coca-Gate, German company, for allowing us to do the presentation with them here uh, on the Zebex conference. Some, 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 um, some facts about FHB, so it's located in Germany. They started in 1947 as a manufacturer for gilt clothing, very well known as carpenter clothing, if uh, you know that. In this segment, as of today, they are still market leader, mm -hmm. and um, they extended the product line to various kinds of so-called work clothing, and um, in uh, 28, so in this year, they became um, the winner of the German Brand Award. And here you see some clothing, what they do. In the middle, you see this typical carpenter cloth, carpenter uh, trousers, which are very well known, and they sell it um, yeah, not only in Germany, but in, in Europe, and I don't know whether they do in the US anything. And this is one of the storage halls where we did the uh, placement of the sensors, we do some environmental stuff, and also we do some uh, Wi-Fi checkings. And uh, this is how it looks in Zabbix. So uh, what you see here is um, just the latest data of such uh, sensor data, and uh, what is great with Zabbix is um, we can not only push um, the data like temperature, humidity, or the dew point, for example, which is quite important to Zabbix, but also we can um, upload stuff like um, our Wi-Fi connection, the Wi-Fi connection time, yeah? and also we do measure, for example, with VCC, the voltage of uh, the battery of the sensor if it's driven mobile. So we have access to all those uh, metrics. Uh, on top you see the fails, so we can even see if we have uh, continuous fails there and set, set up properly trigger. Now as promised, how is this being implemented? So the implementation, what we need is to build uh, a sensor is we need a microcontroller. Our choice was to use an ESP32 from uh, a manufacturer called ESPassive. Um, and also we used the sensor from Bosch, which is a BME 280 or the 680. That depends on what you would like to measure. The 680, for example, provides access to, uh, to uh, also uh, air quality measurements, which we are using. And uh, the communication happens to something which is called I square C. And uh, I square C is also known as the uh, TWI, the two wire interface. Basically, that is a de facto standard in industry for electronic components to exchange messages with each other. And you need some software. And this I square C technology gives us access to um, pressure sensors, weight, motion, distance. There's anything available on the market. So you find a uh, sensor for nearly anything. Uh, special gas detection, electric power, and so on. And uh, here you see the functional diagram of the uh, microcontroller itself. And um, <laughs> when we prepared this talk here, um, my friends told me, hey, don't walk into the depths of this controller. You are on a conference, and I agree. But uh, look, please, to the uh, upper right corner, you see that this controller uh, integrates an RF receiver, an RF transmitter, 
and provides a Bluetooth stack and a Wi-Fi stack. So we have access to Bluetooth communication, we have access to Wi-Fi communication, which is just excellent for us, and we have also access to uh, cryptographic hardware acceleration. Uh, programming happens in C or C++. There's some Python thing available, but we didn't use it or didn't give it a try. As passive, the vendor provides something which is called the IDF, the IoT Development Framework, and uh, also um, uh, on, uh, on, um, as an operating system, we are using FreeRTOS, and FreeRTOS gets support from Amazon. You see the press release from, or press release from uh, May 2018, so from this year, where Amazon says that um, the Vuva kit, for example, is um, qualified for the Amazon FreeRTOS implementation. And it works just excellent. So it gives you some sort of multitasking on um, such an environment, preemptive multitasking to be more precise. Uh, here you see a circuit diagram, and um, it should just show that there's not that much involved. So we don't have many passive components. So basically we have just some uh, LEDs, some resistors, a switch, and some connectors. Um, you will see later on, um, I will provide a Git repository for you, and then you can have a deeper look into all of this. Here you see uh, the description of the Zebix uh, sender protocol. It's taken originally from the Zebix website, so if you look to uh, Zebix documentation, um, appendix, protocols, header, data, land, etc., then you will find it. Basically, we have a header with, an, uh, with, a, with, a, with a magic of four bytes, and a one-byte protocol definition ends up to five bytes, and there's uh, eight bytes in little endian format for the message lang itself, and then um, the JSON for metadata on top of it. So very straightforward, very easy to implement, very effective. From the software design perspective, so to make it usable for, for, for someone, we uh, said we will use three operating modes. So the first mode is the so-called setup mode, uh, where you can set up the device. In this case, um, you just press a button and it will blink some LEDs and then will start its own Wi-Fi access point. It will start a DHCP server, it will start a web server. So basically you can do the entire configuration, for example, from your smartphone. It even opens a so-called captive portal. It's the same thing that you have might uh, seen here when you connect it to the uh, HODL network. We have a power safe mode. The power safe mode is more or less the standard mode. In this case, the sensor will connect to the predefined uh, Wi-Fi network, will do the measurements, will send them over to Zabbix, and then it will fall asleep. So it will turn off the radio and the Wi-Fi communication to not waste any energy. And then we have an online mode or an always on mode. Works pretty much the same as the power safe mode. So the sensor will be on always, so you can uh, always connect to the sensor. It will start also the uh, uh, web server, yeah, so you can get access to the data immediately, and it will provide also on top of it a REST API, so you can query with third-party application all of the metrics that are collected, and it will continually send data to Zabbix as well as in the power safe mode. And then we have some push buttons and LEDs to make it um, uh, so you can see what's going on. Here's a web interface. That is a home screen, so imagine you're connected to the uh, microcontroller, that is not Windows or Linux or something, so you're connected to the microcontroller, so it will uh, provide you a web interface like config status help, and then if you click on config, then you can do your um, setup, so you set up your SSID, your Wi-Fi password, the Zabbix server, et cetera, and then we'll continue to work. We have a status screen where you can see all the metrics in real time to make sure that uh, everything works as expected. There's some other goodies, like the LEDs flash depending on the quality of Wi-Fi, et cetera, but uh, that is beyond our presentation here. And uh, basically, that's it. That's uh, the, sensor the, the sensor part, right? And when we finished that one and we implemented the project, everything was perfectly fine, <laughs> and then someone came up with a question, how many sensors can we connect to Zabbix? So, for example, my hometown is Bielefeld. We have like 500,000 people living there. So the idea was if any, everyone would use a, a sensor, would Zebix work this way? And um, we did a POC. So we did set up a Zebix server with uh, 500,000 hosts, uh, with 7 million items, and with um, 3 million triggers. And then we put load on the Zebix server. Uh, we were close to 60K, as you can see 
on the bottom screenshot. So we were close to 60K new values per second in this scenario with some optimization, uh, optimization of course. And um, to get a better understanding about what we have tested here, in a typical, uh, if, you, if you take the number of new values per second and put them in relation to the number of hosts you have, you can build a ratio. And if you do that for, um, for a general installation, you will find that you have a number X for hosts and a number Y for new values per second. Now, if you look to the IoT setup, you have much more hosts, but um, you have a lower measuring interval. If you look to the calculation, I tried to use a laser the first time here. If you look here to the calculation, you will see that you get the same result if you have 10K hosts with 18 items measured every minute. Uh, you will reach like 3,000 new values per second and you get the same number if you have 600,000 hosts. So we were interested in, can Zebix deal this huge amount of hosts? I mean, it's a completely different scenario for Zebix. And um, for the POC setup, we did the following. We defined um, 50 host groups. Each host group was populated with uh, 10,000 hosts. So we end up with 500,000 hosts. And then we used our uh, sensor template yeah, with uh, 14 items and six triggers. That was a, basically the template that you have seen before for the latest data stuff with like checking the VCC and um, the restart reasons and uh, some other stuff. So what we did is we um, assigned one template to a group of 10,000 hosts. So that way we reached uh, 7 million items and those 3 million triggers and then we started um, we have um, created a load generator. We use this for, uh, if you do, uh, if you do um, big projects and big installations, we have uh, a way to create load and we used our load generators and put all of this uh, on this simple server to see uh, how it worked out. And what I can say is that Zebix server can manage huge numbers of uh, new values per second in an IoT-like environment. So it was behaving excellent. So we were close to 60K, 60,000 new values per second in this scenario, just using a standard Dell server in this case. Uh, no advertisement, would be the same with an IBM or, or an HP server. And we found that the Zebix Trapper protocol or Zebix Trapper items are really, really efficient, so they were excellent. And um, one concern was that Zebix would limit the number of host items due its maximum cache size of eight gig, actually, but we found that we we're not even close. So with our setup, you see the numbers yourself, uh, we were utilizing the cache for like 42%. So we could have increased this stuff to 1 million and I expect it would have worked. Um, depending on how the hosts are organized, so in terms of host groups, et cetera, um, the front end might become a little bit slow. Yeah? And a little bit uh, is, um, yeah, it becomes a little bit slow. And the same applies to templates. Simply if you go to, uh, uh, just uh, for example a template and then it lists the number of hosts in the front end um, that are assigned to, then it will become a little bit uh, laggy. But otherwise, excellent. So really, really excellent. So in summary, the lessons learned from uh, our project uh, with respect to uh, the IoT sensor, it works fine. What you need is uh, you need a very stable uh, Wi-Fi connection because that makes a difference in energy consumption. Otherwise, you won't last long with your battery. And um, Zebix is a great choice if you, if, you, if you use it for getting the metrics because you can get all the metrics like um, the VCC, like how many fails you had, like the RSSI value on top of your uh, metrics you'd like to measure. If you need TLS encryption, we suggest to um, take maybe the proxy and connect to your proxy and let the proxy, do, uh, let the proxy do the encryption work because it saves you additional connection time and thus energy. Don't try to play with standard AA batteries or standard rechargeable cells. They won't work very well um, because uh, of their discharge curve. Uh, better use LiPo or LiFiPo for um, cells. And um, in general, if you use battery powered sensors, then you might set up a trigger to warn when VCC gets low so the user knows when he has to replace a battery. And when you're expecting data in a regular interval, since we're using the Zebix trapper, yeah, so we don't get a notice from, from, from Zebix, uh, I expect data then and then, you might want to set up a no data trigger to uh, let you know if something fails. And for us, it was a good idea to add a REST API to the sensor. 
From the Zebex part, I can say that uh, Zebex is excellent in collecting huge number of values. Uh, it working would be very excellent. And um, you might want to use proxies if data collection itself becomes an issue. And as said before, uh, I suggest to not put more than 10,000 hosts in one host group because otherwise it will be hard to uh, manage from the front end side. And if you want uh, front end paging, then you might um, limit the number of hosts per host group to maybe 1,000. Then paging works pretty well on, on the front end side. And the same applies to templates, of course. Um, if you're going into this volume, if you have this uh, size, then certainly you need to size your database, your Zebex server, the Zebex proxies, and all of the PHP settings accordingly. Uh, Zebex, Zebex Center Protocol, pretty efficient, as said before, very low overhead. And um, from um, our development work, I can say that the recent additions, um, like item preprocessing in Zebex or the real-time export of events and values in Zebex 4.0, um, really made it so much easier to uh, process all of the sensor data in any third-party applications. As promised, uh, here's the uh, project we set up for you for the conference. Uh, you will find um, on GitHub um, the schematics. So how do you, can you do the wiring? Some very basic source code that will work and connect to Zebex and get you some metrics. And uh, also, we added a very basic Zebex template. So build your own device. It uh, should give you a good starting point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Questions, please. Uh, thank you for the awesome presentation. Um, so the first question will be, what type of security encryption or integrity methods uh, can a low-powered IT device use uh, realistically? Actually, as I said, um, so actually we have not implemented um, any, any sort of security stuff, and I know that is an, uh, that is an issue, actually. And um, we haven't done it because it was not needed for our scenario since we use the uh, Zebex uh, proxy to, to do that for us. So we use the encryption of the Zebex proxy. So it's pretty much the same if, uh, I mean, I may, may ask a question. I guess all of you are using Zebex, right? So whom is doing uh, an, an, an encryption with Zebex agent to the Zebex server? Who is doing encryption there? A very few people, yeah? Because it is a trusted zone where you are acting, yeah? And that is pretty much the same thing that we do. Uh, we might add encryption uh, natively on the sensor, but actually we don't do it. Mm, thank you. Uh, are you using just one server? Or, and uh, if yes, what is their parameter? Uh, no, we have uh, different servers, and um, also for the load scenario, we have um, simulated load directly to one server, but we also used um, proxies in between, and then we pushed the load from the, from, from, from the proxies to the Zebex server, which uh, I found the Zebex server can handle much better. And uh, from the size for this setup, it was, uh, it was not really big. I think it was like, uh, it was a Dell machine. It was like uh, two CPUs, eight cores, um, 64, 96 meg of RAM dedicated to this task, yeah. Thank you. And the last, uh, how long your IT device works on battery? I mean, like something medium value. Yeah, fair question, uh, fair question. Um, you remember the slide, the blue one, where I compared all the technologies, yeah? And it was stating like, uh, Wi-Fi will give you two days, yeah? At, at, at max, uh, idle time, et cetera. Um, actually, when, when we do, uh, when we, when we do a, a measurement every hour, so that is the assumption here, so every hour measurement, and we send it over to Zebex, um, it, will, it, will, it will last about 13 months, actually. Yeah, so that is what we can reach with the setup. If you um, go, for example, and say, I do every 10 minutes, it will be much, much smaller. Also, if the Wi-Fi connection is worse, that's why we are tracing the Wi-Fi connection time. So if the Wi-Fi connection time uh, takes like uh, six seconds, seven seconds, 10 seconds, or the negotiation with the access point, I mean, not the transmission itself, then it's, uh, that's, that's expensive. But if everything goes fine, so three seconds, one hour, then about 30 months. 
Awesome, thank you. Uh, no more questions from application? We have, we do have, but I think uh, my okay. crowd also wants to ask some questions. Okay, fair enough. Okay, then questions from the audience, please. And I see a hand raised, so just a second. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned that you are using a really half a million hosts. So if I get it right, you have a half a million such boxes. Yeah. No. Um, I don't want to. <laughs> we, we set up uh, 500,000 hosts on Zebex. Um, so we created those hosts there. And then what we did is we had um, a lot of Zebex proxies out. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we simulated load through those Zebex proxies. Oh, okay. Uh, by utilize, like I said, so we have a software application that acts as a load generator, and the load being generated is exactly the same type of load, so the messages that are being sent, as the sensor uses. So they're using a similar JSON payload. I actually was going to ask about the process of uh, installing one in uh, uh, any one of these box of these hosts. Because if you used half a million hosts, it, it would be a nightmare to install them manually it would be impossible. So I was just interested whether you have a process of uh, auto-registration, auto-configuration, or something like that. Uh, maybe you have an uh, application that initializes the, the device. The I, I'm not sure whether I really understood the question, but I think you are asking about how we did the test and how we did the setup. Yeah? And if yes. that is uh, the reason for the question, I try to uh, answer as good as I can. Uh, we use the Zebix API, the well-known Zebix API to create the host, to assign okay. the templates. Uh, then we knew the names and we knew the host group assignment. There was a tedious process, by the way, different story. And um, then we used um, the load generator yeah, and generated load for those particular hosts. Yeah? And we did, I think, we did this test, always a set of 1,000 hosts or so. Yeah? And so we were addressing all of them to utilize uh, Zebex, yeah? So we did not just send to one host, but to all of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, more questions? Yes, please. Well, with half a million hosts, how many active alerts do you have? How many what? Active alerts, how many? problems. Oh, you mean how many problems we have? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in our in our in our scenario, we disabled all except one trigger. Yeah. Understandable. Yeah. Okay. Fair, fair question. I mean, yeah, fair question and straight answer. Okay, I see question in the <laughs> middle. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, the question is, is it possible to have different intervals for metrics and for transmitting of data to Zabbix? Yeah. Um, so um, number one, actually no. So we, we, we take the metrics at the same time and transmit them at the same time. And um, the next, uh, the next so-called generation, if you want to, uh, will be uh, some sort of data logging. So it will be possible to store the data. So my, maybe I can, the, the, from an energy consumption point, if it's stationary, then it's no problem. So we have energy because we can use a power supply. But if you if we, if we look for mobile applications or uh, applications they don't have network access, then we're looking for something like a data logger application where we can have uh, also different measurement intervals because the measuring itself is cheap, so it doesn't cost energy that much. And we can take measurements like every 10 minutes or every minute, then we add them up, store them locally, and then send them over to Zabbix maybe once a day or every hour, depending on the, on the user's choice. So that will be the next generation of it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more question. Thank you. My question is, uh, how do you configure unique uh, host name when using Zabbix Sander protocol for each device? Yeah, I is see. So what we do is, um, you have seen this in the, um, okay, I don't know which screenshot it was, but there was a screenshot. Uh, and what we did is, to, to make a difference, um, we have a prefix and we have a 
Um, so we have a prefix, we assign a prefix as a host name, dot, and then the host name itself. And um, then you configure this prefix and the host name in the sensor. You have to do it manually. So we're actually using not ZX agent active, uh, if that is a question. Um, and um, that has to match. So it's configured manually, actually. But we can use ZX agent active protocol and enable active registration. Yeah, but at this time, we don't want this because um, we want to have control about, uh, otherwise you have a typo and you create lots of hosts we don't want to have there. <clears throat> okay, one more. Uh, my question is, you have so many uh, agents or devices, so how do you deal with the uh, update, self-update or configuration of the files? Yeah. So, uh, so, so it, I think it's a big problem because you need to consider a lot of devices. Thank you very much for that question, and um, the answer is very simple. Um, if you look to the IDF, to the, inter, uh, to the, um, to the Expressive uh, IoT Development Kit, uh, you will find that they support something which is called OTR over the air update. And if you want to use OTR, then you have to do some special partitioning on the chip that is quite technical, yeah? But in a nutshell, I can say you can have a firmware running, you leave free space for a different firmware, then you can initiate an over the air update through Wi-Fi, for example, and once the uh, over the air update is finished, then you can ask the application software to switch between the old version and the new version. Then can do some initial initialization process, and if that is successful, then this will be the new baseline. And this way, you can automatically update those sensors, which is pretty easy and nice. There are other options like predefined values and defaults, but that is, um, yeah. So that works. Okay, any more questions? So, uh, any last question to Wolfgang? Okay, okay, is that a question? Okay, later, yeah, during the party time, <laughs> you'll have a lot of time for the questions. So, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Yeah, thank you.